hello to you all and welcome to this Intelligence Squared podcast, which is being hosted by me, uh, Sonia Soda. I'm Chief Leader Writer at The Observer and an Observer and Guardian columnist. And I'm really excited to be hosting this conversation today with Laura Bates, who is founder of the Everyday Sexism Project. She's the author of many books on feminism, including The Burning. Her latest book, which is just out, is called Men Who Hate Women. I've got a copy of it here. Um, I've read it. I've written about it. I would highly recommend it uh, to all of you if you enjoy this conversation. I think, personally, it's a very important book, and the more people that read it, the better. So do go and get a copy. Um, a quick reminder before we kick off the conversation uh, with Laura, if you do enjoy today's podcast, we'd really appreciate you pressing the like button and subscribing to the channel. And if you've got thoughts on our discussion, do feel free to leave a comment in the, in the comments section below. So without further ado, we will kick off uh, with Laura. Um, Laura, I guess First of all, it would be just great to hear the backstory to this book. How did you come to write a book about men who hate women? Well, I'd been aware of these communities for some time. Um, and I think it, it, I started thinking about this around the time that we saw the resurgence of the Me Too movement. And it felt like we were in a very positive place in many ways, in that thanks to the courage and the bravery of millions of survivors, we were finally becoming more comfortable as a society, having a conversation about sexual violence, about sexual harassment, and yet still we were comfortable talking about women as victims, but very uncomfortable even then with the idea of a conversation about groups of men as perpetrators. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to think about the existence of these communities which are actively inciting and carrying out hate-fueled violent attacks on women and how we could tackle something like that if people didn't even know it existed. For me, the tipping point was um, recognizing the extent to which these communities were grooming and radicalizing schoolboys. So in my work in schools where I regularly speak in perhaps two schools a week, mm -hmm. I suddenly started hearing perhaps two years ago, increasing numbers of boys regurgitating false facts and identical quotes in schools from rural Scotland to inner city London, where it was very clear that they had been groomed online by the same groups and the same people. And what kind um, of thing were they saying? So they were saying things like they believed that the vast majority of rape allegations are false. Mm -hmm. um, that men everywhere were losing their jobs because of a wave of totally fake stories made up by women to undermine them. Um, that the gender pay gap is a feminist myth that there's a feminist conspiracy at the heart of our government um, set on undermining and attacking white men who are the real victims of the vast majority of inequality in today's society. And there was a real intolerance of any opposing views or, or different facts or figures, even though I knew that the figures and the statistics that they gained from these online movements were false and quite startlingly so, you know, things like 90% of rape allegations are false, that kind of thing. And how would you respond when you got boys sort of and young men standing up in sort of, you know, assembly halls sort of, or classrooms putting these things to you? Well, as gently as possible, because I think the problem with radicalization, which is what this is, and if it were any other group doing it, we would be using that terminology, um, is that they've already been very cleverly primed to... Um, understand that you have been brainwashed that anybody that tries to talk them out of it is a kind mm -hmm. of you know feminazi left-wing pc warrior snowflake whatever so going in hard with this is nonsense it, it doesn't help you have to listen you have to be prepared to um, listen to their fears and their anxieties um, for me i found that one of the most useful things was to talk in detail about the impact of gender inequality, gender stereotyping, um, masculinity, and a kind of societal version of how that should play out on boys themselves, to talk about male crises, the male mental health crisis, to talk about body image impacting on young men, to really make it clear that this isn't about one group against another, but that actually all the issues that feminists are fighting have a massive positive knock-on impact and are also about lifting up and supporting boys and men in their experiences as well. 
So I want to come back to this issue of kind of radicalisation um, very soon and um, what you saw happening in schools and why you think that is. But first of all, I'd like to just get you to sort of, you sort of look at a number of different online misogynistic movements. And I wonder if, first of all, you could just give our listeners a bit of a, a summary in a nutshell what those movements that you looked at were. Absolutely. So this is a group of communities and movements loosely um, under the umbrella term of the manosphere. It's not my term. I don't think it's a particularly useful term because it, it, it minimizes. Like life, it? Yes, it belittles it. It, it. it makes it sound like a joke and like it's kind of pathetic, which is how many people react to these movements when they hear about them, mistakenly in my view. Um, but the individual communities within the manosphere, which I looked at, include at the most extreme end, incels, or so-called involuntary celibates. These are men who are not having sex and want to be. And instead of looking at their own hatred of women as being part of the potential reason for that, um, they focus on the idea that evil, inhuman women are denying them what is their birthright as men. And they fantasize about raping women, about keeping them as sex slaves, and about a day of retribution, an incel rebellion, when these men will rise up and slaughter the stuck-up, spoiled, beautiful women who have refused to sleep with them, and the men who are managing to have sex with those women in some cases. So these sound like a very extreme and probably very small group of people, but the reality I discovered was actually a really sprawling community in the hundreds of thousands across blogs, websites, um, online chat rooms, support groups, forums, message boards. And these are men who have gone offline and acted on this ideology. These are men who have committed massacres offline of women in the name of this ideology, but it hasn't been called terrorism, whether by the police, the justice system, uh, or the media. And what sort of massacres are we talking about? So we're talking about the Santa Barbara massacre, where mm. Elliot Roger, for example, killed six people and injured another 14, or the Toronto van attack, which many people may have heard of, where Alec Manassian deliberately drove a speeding rental van into pedestrians, um, killing 10 people, injuring another 16, most of them women. Um, but more cases as well, a teenage boy named Ben Moynihan in the UK who attempted to murder three separate women over a two month period by stabbing them. A case in Canada earlier this year where a, a teenage boy took a machete into a massage parlor and murdered a woman. Um, another man in Canada this year who attempted to um, murder a, a woman and her toddler, a girl, her female baby um, in the parking lot of a, of a shop. Um, these are not the only cases. In the book, I've traced this ideology directly to over 100 deaths or serious injuries in the last 10 years. And wow. these are men who have explicitly carried out these acts in the name of a hate fueled vitriolic ideology of a misogynistic extremism. So it meets every definition, every level of what's required to define it as terrorism internationally. And yet that isn't a definition that's brought to bear on almost any of the cases, with one exception, the boy with the machete, who has been charged with a terror offence. And so we will come back again to this idea of terrorism and why we seem so reluctant as a society to put these sorts of attacks into the category of terrorism. But just before we do that, tell me about the other online communities you looked at. So then there are men going their own way. These are men who uh, believe that women are so dangerous and toxic with their false rape allegations, with their tendency to um, cheat on their husbands and secretly have babies and then force men to bring up those children that aren't actually their own, um, with their false workplace sexual harassment allegations that strip men of their jobs, that they believe the safest possible course of action is simply to cut women out of your life altogether, to have nothing to do with them, no sexual or romantic relationships, if possible, no contact at all. Which again, sounds very extreme and ridiculous, and it's easy to dismiss as a kind of uh, internet cul-de-sac with a few men in, but the reality is that this is becoming an incredibly popular ideology. There was a recent study, for example, that found that 27% of American men now refuse to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with female colleagues in the workplace. And of course, the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, famously refuses to have dinner alone with any woman other than his wife. So this is another good example, I think, of a community easily dismissed but in reality, you know, some of the bigger leaders of this community, um, which is very active on YouTube, um, 
they have views and uh, followers and views of their videos in, in the tens or even hundreds of millions. So we are talking about something more pervasive than you mm -hmm. might think. And then there are pickup artists. Um, again, this is a kind of related community because like incels, they view women very much as sex objects there um, for the sole purpose of providing sex to men. Um, but if you think of incels and pickup artists, both seeing women as kind of sexual slot machines, incels think that the machines are rigged and will never pay out to them. Pickup artists believe that anybody anywhere can be taught the secret combination of buttons to press and levers to pull to force any woman to have sex with them almost against her will. They talk about women in terms of training Labradors, essentially. Um, they talk about using um, verbal tics to kind of trick and almost hypnotize women. They talk about deliberately sexually harassing women in the street or in public space when women don't want to talk to them. And at the more extreme end, they talk about overcoming last minute resistance, which means forcing a woman to have sex with you when she's right. changed her mind. Essentially rape, absolutely. And these are men who have sometimes boasted about rape in their kind of guru classes that they're providing to other men. They're gurus and leading lights of this industry who are training other men in these so-called techniques, have uploaded videos of themselves online, sexually assaulting strange women in the street. Um, they've made arguments, for example, that rape should be legalized on public property. So it's much darker and much bigger a phenomenon than our kind of pop culture representation of sort of Barney Stinson in How I Met Your Mother or Joey and Friends might suggest. I mean, so we as feminists are supposed to kind of be feeling positive, especially in the wake of kind of Me Too, as you mentioned, you know, attitudes are supposed to be changing, particularly amongst the generation, younger generation of girls and boys growing up to be young men and women. Um, but this really sounds horribly kind of dark ages. So I guess, what is it that's attracting men to these communities? How are they building themselves? Well, it's complicated. Um, I think early sort of superficial analyses of these communities tend to suggest that perhaps there's a big class element, that it's as a kind of about poor white boys being left behind. But if you look at the demographics of these communities, while there is evidence to suggest that they're predominantly white, um, there are also large numbers of men within them who seem to be um, uh, middle class, um, fairly independently wealthy, um, white men, college educated, who sort of believe that their sense of entitlement to certain positions in society is being challenged and threatened um, by progress towards equality. So certainly you could say that one aspect of this is a backlash to a burgeoning feminist movement. There is certainly evidence to suggest that this movement has exploded as the current wave of feminism has gained in kind of um, public awareness. Um, I'd say, for example, if you look at 4chan, which is one of the communities where mm -hmm. we know that um, often people start their journeys into the manosphere, where you'll see trolls gathering, for example, that's a website that gets 28 million unique monthly video, uh, visitors. Mm -hmm. And by far its most popular um, board sort of area on the website is um, the random one, which is the one where trolls tend to congregate. Their demographic is overwhelmingly white, college-educated men um, between the ages of about 18 and 34. So that kind of backs up that theory. I say the college-educated thing is really surprising to me because you would expect men who've been to university to be a bit more liberal. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to be careful with the idea that younger men are kind of coming up with different mm -hmm. attitudes and that things are sort of generally getting better if we just sit back and wait. Every year, the British Attitude Survey asks people whether they think a woman was fully or partly to blame for being raped if she had been flirting or if she was drunk. And every year, very depressingly, the answer comes back that a quarter of the British public thinks she was to blame if she'd been drinking and a third if she'd been flirting. But every year amongst younger people, amongst 18 year olds, that figure is much higher. So there is evidence to suggest that young people's attitudes might actually be more extreme when it comes to misogyny and victim blaming than we might like to think. But it's also the case, I think, that a lot of the people drawn into these communities have very real problems and vulnerabilities. Because we're talking about communities in the hundreds of thousands, 
obviously it's a very complex and nuanced picture obviously not all of these men are going out and killing women offline obviously not all of them are even talking about that or inciting that and there's certainly evidence that some of the people in these communities are men who have had very difficult personal experiences offline men who are affected by social isolation by mental health problems and vulnerable teenagers who are anxious who have understandable questions and anxieties about girls and have been kind of sucked into this vortex by their very deliberate kind of recruitment strategies. So one problem I think is that we're not tackling these kinds of issues offline. We've seen 600 youth centres closed in the last few years. We've seen huge slashes to funding for youth workers and all of this affects young people and in particular young men's mental health and makes them ripe targets for this kind of online radicalisation. So yes, you, that, there's that word again, radicalisation. So I wonder if you could just um, talk me through what you mean by that word and what it looks like, because, you know, these aren't boys who are probably sort of, you know, Googling incel movement uh, when they're looking for this stuff. So explain to me how they come across this. And, and you actually posed, didn't you, as a sort of young man as part of your research for the book. So I'd just be interested in hearing more about that and the role that technology plays in all of this. Yeah, of course. So I saw firsthand how this happens. These communities are extremely tech savvy. They're extremely adept at using the internet and using the kind of terminology of the internet to very slowly and carefully groom boys. So absolutely, boys that have been affected by this kind of ideology might never have actually heard the term incel. By and large, the boys I come into contact with in schools aren't necessarily members of individual incel or pickup artistry communities. They're coming into contact with the material and the ideology of these communities, but sort of smuggled further downstream and very easily accessible um, uh, memes, for example, Instagram comedy memes, cultural touch points and references, viral videos. And this isn't a coincidence, so that it's been deliberately written by members of the these extremist communities that they see these viral comedy memes and jokes and images and videos and, and direct links to popular culture as a way of what they describe as adding cherry flavor to children's medicine in order to target boys as young as 11 and with a very gradual drip 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 of desensitization to misogyny then slowly dragging them down further towards jokes about rape until eventually you get to the point where the joke isn't necessarily a joke anymore and they very much see it as well as a slipway to other forms of radicalization that's really important to note i think this is very much tied up with the alt-right with white supremacy and neo-nazism and neo-nazis are deliberately seeing extreme misogyny and anti-feminist rhetoric as a kind of way to open the door to those other forms of white supremacist ideologies. And they're able to do it because social media platforms have the most enormous influence. YouTube, for example, has 1.5 billion users, which is bigger than the number of households that own a TV. And their impact on young people is particularly extreme. I think for adults, we think of YouTube as the home of movie trailers and, and grumpy cat videos. So it's easy to kind of dismiss it in terms of the influence it has as a platform. But we know it's the most popular social media platform amongst young people. We know that the majority of young people say that YouTube is where they get their news from. And if you look at the numbers, it's absolutely mind boggling. So we know that 37% of all global internet traffic is accounted for by YouTube alone. And we know that 70% of the videos people watch on YouTube are the ones recommended to them by the algorithm after they've finished watching what they went looking for. And why so, is that important? It's important because the algorithm directs people towards videos that will serve YouTube. Basically, all YouTube wants is to keep you watching for as long as it can. So whistleblowers who have left the engineering team of YouTube have come out and said, listen, this algorithm isn't directing you to the best content, the highest quality or the most relevant. It's, it's absolutely focusing on directing you towards increasingly extreme content because that's what keeps people watching. So if you're watching a video about uh, picnics and suddenly you're watching an all you can eat challenge, that's not such a big deal. If you're watching a video about jogging and it takes you to extreme marathon runners, that's not such a big deal. But if you started out asking something quite insipid, like what is feminism? And suddenly within a couple of videos, you're being told that evil women are ruining the world and white and men- And is that literally what happens if you were to type that sort of question into YouTube? 
Yes. So in the book specifically, I kind of take you through this as I did it myself. And I started with the question, what is feminism? And it came up with a really innocuous video of Emma Watson speaking at the UN. But the next 10 videos that came up that were recommended by the algorithm started off with talking about how the gender pay gap is a myth and how the modern feminist movement is very bitter and angry and lesbianic. That was Milo Yiannopoulos being interviewed, saying that that was his word, not mine. Um, and then gradually on to more and more kind of conspiracy theories until you reach a point of being told that women hate men, that feminists are taking over the world, that white men are under attack, that rape allegations are false within literally just a few videos without even having to click anything. So it matters then at that point, if you put those two stats together from earlier and you realize 25% of all mobile internet traffic globally is just accounted for by people watching the videos YouTube has chosen for them to watch. At that point, it really matters that the YouTube algorithm has essentially been hijacked by a vast influencer network of extreme misogynistic and alt-right figures, and that it's very much taking young people down a kind of algorithmic rabbit hole. So you sort of set out in your book how, you know, extreme misogynistic ideology has actually led to real world massacres and um, women and men losing their lives um, when you talk about radicalization it, it feels to me like there are real and grooming it feels to me like there are real parallels there with how we see young people kind of indoctrinated into far right or islamist ideology for example so i guess my you know and, and then you've talked as well about the links between online extreme misogyny and far right ideology so why do you think we're struggling as a society to see this as terrorism and to take counter-terrorist approaches to it. I think there are two reasons. I think the first is that people have very little idea of the existence of these communities at all, or if they do know about them, of the extent of them, of how vitriolic and hate-fueled they are, of the extent to which they are inciting and acting on incitement to offline violence, um, and of the sheer numbers of people involved. So the first thing is people don't know these communities even exist, which makes it very difficult to protect boys from being radicalized by them. But the second problem, I think, is that even where we do talk about it, even where men who have committed massacres have outright said in their police interviews that they were radicalized online, that they hated women, that they were murdering these women for not having sex with them, police chiefs have still come out and given interviews to the international media saying there is no evidence that this is linked to terrorism. What that means, I think, is that we have a very specific idea as a society of what we consider to be terrorism and we see this already in the way in which we deal very differently in the media with terrorists who are acting in the name of for example extreme islamist ideology or mm -hmm. white supremacy we tend to see headlines where, well first of all they're much more likely to be reported on at all if the perpetrator is muslim mm -hmm. secondly the headlines tend to emphasize evil terrorist in one of those cases when we talk about kind of the baby-faced child who turned out to be a killer if it's a white man we talk about about lone wolves, we talk about outliers, we talk about isolated incidents and freak accidents and mental health problems. So already when we're talking about white men as perpetrators, we are much less likely to see them as part of an extremist ideology. But then go even one step further, when that extremist ideology is extremist misogyny, I think it fits into a pattern that we consider normal. We are so used to seeing women losing their lives to men. Mm. Over two women every week are killed by a current or former partner. One in three women on the planet will be raped or beaten at some point in her lifetime. So the phenomenon of male hatred and violence against women is normal to us. It is very much part of the wallpaper and that makes it more difficult for people to recognize this as an extremist hate movement. I think you're right and it's not just terrorism where we see that minimized, is it? I'm thinking of, you know, for years women have been pointing out newspaper headlines that minimize domestic abuse and murder that happens in the home or the so-called private sphere uh, where women are as you say killed or, or killed by former or current partners uh, yet the story is all on you know how a man was provoked for example. 
Yes, exactly. So in the book, I highlight recent headlines, for example, that described men who have massacred their families as one was described as a henpecked husband in the headline. Uh, one was described as a barbecue dad um, who was desperately sad about the fact that his marriage had broken down. We tend to excuse and minimize and seek to understand these men. There was even an article in very recently in one of our biggest read national newspapers that used the word understandable in describing a man who had massacred not only his wife but also his teenage daughter. Um, it's, it's so common to try and look for justification and excuses for these men and the real tragedy is that they are directly linked to terrorism. So there was for example a big study by the Everytown group in the United States of um, massacres that had occurred, mass killings, terror attacks between 2009 and 2018 during which period in 54% of the cases, um, an intimate family member um, had been killed as part of the massacre. And around a third of the perpetrators of mass attacks in the US have a history of domestic violence, abuse, stalking, or abuse of women. So the connections are there. If we were to take domestic violence seriously, the red flags that they provide could have a massive impact in helping us to prevent other atrocities. But as always, for generations, women have been canaries singing in coal mines, dying quietly and going completely unheard. And what is the impact of this on women and indeed men on society? I mean, obviously, there's a very extreme end what you talk about, the sort of massacres that we've seen by incels. But how else is this manifesting itself? Well, that's what I'm really interested in, actually. Obviously, we can talk about and define the incidents. We can pinpoint the incidents where men have murdered in the name of these ideologies. What we don't know is the sheer extent of the impact these ideologies might be having as they sort of slither offline into schools, into classrooms. There is strong, into homes, there's strong evidence that members of uh, men's rights activist groups, which is another one of the communities that I look at in the book, um, have, for example, caught the ear of policymakers in the United States, in Australia, in the UK. Yeah. We have currently serving politicians, one of them on our Women and Equalities Committee, who have spoken. I know which at, one you mean. <laughs> who have spoken at men's rights conferences and and openly, whilst holding important positions in our government relating to justice, for example, said mm. that the justice system is horribly stacked against men and boys and advantages women and girls. So, actually, the impact of these groups is potentially quite massive, mm. and at a personal level as well. If we have tens of thousands of men on websites learning a woman really wants to be raped, you're just playing into her fantasy, for example, which is a very normal quote from a pickup website, how many women in their everyday lives may have come into contact with perhaps been sexually assaulted by a man whose ideology has been influenced by the manosphere? There's a horrible case in the book, for example, of a rape victim who found her rape in chilling detail on a pickup artistry website where her rapists had detailed everything that had happened as a kind of triumphant report to their peers. Um, so I think the potential impact is is much greater than the size of the communities and certainly our perception of their size might suggest. And I'm also thinking that, you know, if you're a boy coming into contact with this stuff in your quite formative years, when you're sort of thinking about, you know, your relationships with girls and young women, um, you don't have to become an incel for this to impact on how you interact with women, your first few girlfriends, how you treat them. And I, I you know, I can imagine it'd be very difficult to measure, but I would be worried about some of the stuff that I read in your book, even if it's quite low level, being associated, for example, with coercive control and domestic abuse. Absolutely. And I think that's where it comes down to recognising that this is a form of radicalisation, because if it's able to happen silently, then there are a generation of boys coming into contact with this ideology without any kind of offsetting information, without any attempt to give them alternative facts and information. And the impact of that could be really massive. I mean, an example that springs to mind immediately is a young woman who wrote to me, um, in one of her first weeks at university to say that she'd had sex with a boy uh, boyfriend for the first time. Um, they were both 18 and she said that halfway through he suddenly started trying to choke her completely mm. out of the blue and unexpectedly. And she managed to push him off and afterwards he 
broke down in tears and said, I thought that was what you'd be expecting. So there is, it is very extreme and, and it very much overlaps, I think, with the impact of online pornography. The yeah. fact that, you know, we know that 60% of young people have seen online mm. porn by the age of 14 mm. and a quarter or 12 or younger when they first see it. So we're talking about ideas which um, contribute to the kind of dehumanization of their female peers, to the idea that the way to be a man is to have power and sexual control over women, to be dominant, to be an alpha male, to be strong and all of this is kind of fed into and these aren't just my own anecdotal observations for the book I interviewed the lead facilitator of the Good Lad Initiative which is probably the biggest UK organization on the ground talking to young boys about this regularly and he mm -hmm. estimated that 70% of the young people he worked with in schools across the UK had come into contact with these ideologies in some form so this isn't a small minor problem. I think you know so I said at the start, this is a really important book, but in some ways it's also quite a scary book, um, you know, and I've talked to a lot of friends about it, my friends with children, because I think if you've got a young boy, it's quite, and, and a young girl, to be honest, it's very important to kind of be aware of this. But I guess, what would your message, you know, what would your message be to parents who are really worried about some teachers? What can they do? I think there is a lot they can do, and that's quite reassuring to yeah. hear. Um, I also want to say that this isn't an attempt at scaremongering, you know, although I do think this is impacting boys to a, a great degree. I also know that I'm meeting boys across the country who are really interested in feminism and advancing equality, who are, you know, really keen to be part of the solution as well. So that's important to say there are all sorts of positive signs about teenage boys today as well. As teachers and parents, I think the first thing and the most important thing is to familiarize yourself with the reality of young people's online worlds and the territory that they frequent on a daily basis, because there can be a big gap between adult perceptions of what that looks like and the reality of the wallpaper of young people's online lives. So I'd recommend getting stuck in, you know, type in feminism or feminist gets destroyed on YouTube and just see the kind of string of what the algorithm presents you. Have a look at some of the bigger red pill sites on Reddit, even sign up perhaps for some of the big comedy. Red, red pill, just for our, our listeners, you may not be familiar with that. So red pill is a term used by almost all of these manosphere groups to um, describe the moment of taking the red pill, which is borrowed from The Matrix, ironically a film by two trans women with these communities being very transphobic. They don't seem to note the irony of that. The idea is that when you take the red pill, it's the moment when you see the reality of the world for how it really is. The scales fall away and you realize you've been lied to your whole life and that the world which you've been told discriminates against women or against people of color is actually desperately stacked against poor white men who are the real victims of our society. So looking at kind of Reddit red pill websites is a good way to get an idea of the kind of baseline of this kind of stuff. Then you can look out for particular words that teenagers might use that would be a good indication that they've come across this content. Uh, normies, which is the word that they use for kind of members of society outside the manosphere. Um, words like based or triggered or butthurt, which are what they use to describe people who've been kind of offended by manosphere rhetoric or ideology. Um, anybody who's kind of had a sudden recent change in views and particularly marked by a real intolerance to alternative views, that can be a really big red flag for radicalization. And for me, communication is the single most important way to tackle this. Young people, if they don't have anywhere else to talk, to air these kinds of grievances and anxieties and fears, then the manosphere will welcome them with open arms. So it's not about judging them or making them feel punished or that they're, they're going to be sort of, um, you know, held in contempt for this. It's very much about giving them space to communicate. And I'd really recommend for schools and parents to think about possibly looking at an initiative like the Good Lad Initiative coming in to talk to pupils. They are fantastic because they send cool men, young guys into schools to talk to boys and guys that they'll be able to look up to and relate to. Exactly. Who won't make them feel judged or punished or that they're about to get in trouble, but who will give them space to interrogate some of this stuff and helping them to question online sources and to realize that they can't necessarily trust everything that they read online, helping them to interrogate it for themselves rather than just telling them that they're wrong is key, I think. 
And is there any evidence about what works once sort of a young man has kind of got quite drawn into this route and you know, the process of radicalization is well underway? Is there any evidence about what works in undoing that? So sadly, we have to draw the evidence from this, um, from other forms of de-radicalization, because as far as I'm aware, there is nothing dedicated in terms of de-escalation or de-radicalization organizations focusing specifically on these extremist forms of misogyny. But if you look at some of the de-radicalization projects that are targeting neo-Nazis and white supremacists, they often focus on demolishing the idea of the other as a kind of monstrous um, mm -hmm. caricature. So for example, um, there's one expert who recently gave an interview in The Atlantic where he talked about um, introducing a white supremacist neo-Nazi um, to an imam and then actually striking up this great friendship and creating this relationship that helped to dismantle a lot of the myths that had been fed to this man as he was radicalized um, about what it meant to be a Muslim, about what kind of person you would be. Now, whenever I apply this to what we're talking about, people immediately go, but that couldn't happen with, with boys and girls because they mix, because they grow up together. So, you know, why are you saying that? But I really believe we have a problem with gender segregation in our society, in our schools, from the age of being a toddler, if two children sit down next to each other in a playgroup, you'll hear people going, oh, look, they're on their first date. Lock up your daughters. She's going to be a heartbreaker. We sexualize and thereby stigmatize mixed gender friendships amongst children from an incredibly young age. And actually, at a roundtable meeting recently about education and sexism, I was sitting next to a young Muslim teacher who said, if the children in my classroom were segregated by religion, or race, I would consider it to be a huge problem. And so would the school and we take action. But every day at lunchtime, the six or seven year olds in my classroom separate themselves invariably every day by gender. And mm. it's not seen as a problem. It's even almost encouraged. It's seen mm. as normal. It's you natural. Have different views. It's natural. Boys are interested in these things. Girls are like this. Boys and girls mm. are different. They have different interests. Oh, look, the party invitations are pink princess ones. So we won't invite any boys to your party this year. And it just happens to such a degree that by the time these forms of radical Organizations start to chip in, they are able to other and dehumanize female peers because boys don't necessarily have meaningful platonic relationships with them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. although it seems very far away from the problem, at a kind of broader level, trying to dismantle some of these gender stereotypes and the way in which we treat relationships platonically between boys and girls could have a big impact as well, I think. And what are the social media companies doing? I feel like I know the answer to this before I ask really, but are they doing enough? I really don't think they're doing enough and I really think they could do more. I just think we have to look at the uh, relationship between the amount of power they have and the amount of accountability. And for me, that is a very unskewed balance at the moment. You know, we, mm. if you're talking about your choice of what your algorithm chooses representing a quarter of mobile internet traffic, that is enormous power mm. that you're wielding and frankly if you have an income the size of several small countries mm. you do have the money to fix this problem if you wanted to mm. what i suspect is that the will isn't there unless it affects their bottom line and because we're talking about such vast communities the risk for them is that tackling it could alienate a number of their members you know so we hear them kind of holding up their hands and saying oh it's really difficult to tackle this with algorithms we're doing our best but it's a real problem but I'm sorry you have multi-billion dollars worth of profits so you could if you wanted to hire a hundred thousand human moderators tomorrow and train yeah. them alongside civil society organizations to deal with this mm. manually um, I think that they value the um, perception of their sites by some of their more extreme users above the safety on their platforms of women and girls and other groups. And just to round up, um, what, are the, what are the reasons that you see to sort of be optimistic going forward? Well, I think that there is enormous room for improvement here. And I'm hoping that this starts a conversation because we can't fix it unless we can start to talk about it. 
Um, I feel that young people are really giving me a great deal of hope for the future. You know, the schools that I go into, these are a generation of young people who have been labelled cowards and snowflakes and, and, you know, PC warriors. Mm -hmm. It really couldn't be further from the truth. This is a generation of young people who are brave, who are courageous, who are standing up for themselves and fighting back in very difficult circumstances. Um, you know, there are girls being told to go home from school because their leggings might distract the boys who are coming up to school the next day with placards protesting, saying, are my leggings lowering your test scores? Um, these are schools where girls who've been told that they can't hold a feminist society because it might be considered controversial or divisive are going underground and holding one anyway. You know, there is so much going on. There are so many inspiring young people um, who are aware of this stuff and are fighting back against it. And that gives me hope for the future. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Laura, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, discussion today. Uh, I'm Sonia Soda, Chief Eater Writer at The Observer, and you've been listening to Intelligence Squared.